My name is Rick Renner, and today I'm in the Resurrection of Christ Church in St. Petersburg, a church that was officially opened and consecrated in 1907. But then the communist regime came to power and the church was officially closed in the 1930s. And after it was closed, it was used for various things. For example, for a period of time, this fabulous building was used as a warehouse for potatoes. Then the communist regime decided they would completely explode the building and demolish it, but that was stopped by the events of World War II. And during World War II, this was used as a morgue for the dead. Then after World War II, it was turned into a warehouse. It was used as a place where they stored props from a local theatrical company. This basically became a big warehouse and it fell into ruin. But finally, it was reopened in 1997 as an official museum. And truly, it is unique, unlike any other church. The walls of this church are covered with more than 71,000 square feet of beautiful mosaics, which are created in a mosaic workshop right here in St. Petersburg. And the mosaics tell the story of the life of Jesus. Jesus casting out a demon. Jesus healing the woman with the issue of blood. Jesus multiplying the loaves and the fishes. Jesus walking on the water. There is even a depiction of Pentecost. It is simply remarkable and unthinkable that it had been abandoned for so many years. But today, it has been splendidly restored. It is simply magnificent, and the walls are covered with billions of pieces of glass fashioned into these marvelous mosaics. And it today is a favorite site where tourists come when they visit the city of St. Petersburg. But when I committed this place, it's a temple. It's really a temple. But hey, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, that we as the church are the corporate temple of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 says we individually are the temples of the Holy Spirit, but as a body, 1 Corinthians 3, 16 says, corporately together we make up the habitation of God in the earth. That's the church. The real church is not a building like this. The real church are people people who form a place where God dwells by His Spirit and corporately, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit and God literally lives in us and among us. That's why we need each other as the church. And that is what I'm going to talk to you about today. Stay tuned for a teaching you can trust, a message that will inspire, strengthen, and equip you with vital insights and understanding from the Word of God. Here is Rick. Welcome to today's program. As I told you in the introduction, today I'm going to talk to you about us being the temple of the Holy Spirit up until now. In this brand new series, I've been talking about each one of us being a walking sanctuary. But today I'm going to talk about the church because corporately we also are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And this teaching is profoundly important. And it's just one piece of a whole series, which is called, You Are the Temple of the Holy Spirit. It's 10 parts, and it comes in multiple formats. You should order this series today. This is a series that will really open your eyes to what you carry in you and what you are a part of. My friend, God has created you. He's fashioned you to be the temple of the Holy Spirit. Only God could do something so magnificent, and you need to understand it. That's why I want you to order the series called You Are the Temple of the Holy Spirit, and it comes with a study guide, and the study guide is just marvelous. It's filled with all the points, the principles, all the Greek words in this series. Everything in the programs is in this study guide, and when you read it and hear it or see it together, it really reinforces everything that you're learning. And you can order all of this 
at our website, storerunner.org. And when you go there, please browse around because there are so many resources which we provide for you there in our website store. And we're also offering you right now my book, which is called A Life Ablaze. You can keep your fire burning your whole spiritual life. You do not have to lose your fire along the way. You can start on fire, stay on fire, and end up on fire. My friends, that's the will of God for your life, for you to be a life ablaze. And in this book, I deal with the 10 essential fuels you have to be injecting into your flame for your fire to keep burning. Don't lose your fire. Stir it up. And this book will teach you how to do that. And I want to tell you that if you need prayer, we're here for you. We really long to pray for you. We as a ministry are very committed to praying for people who contact us. And if you contact us with a prayer need, you can be sure we will sincerely pray. Either write us or give us a call. And as soon as we hear from you, we will agree with Jeremiah 33, 3, which says, call unto me. And I'll show you great and mighty things that thou knowest not. We will call out to God with you and believe for him to do mighty things on your behalf. So give us a call or send us an email. And if you're not a partner, please pray about becoming a partner with our ministry. A partner is someone who regularly financially supports the ministry, joining hands with us so we can take this teaching of the Bible to people all over the earth, people everywhere are crying out for God to send them someone who can bring them teaching they can trust. That's our job. And when you become a partner, you help us take the teaching of the Bible to people all over the world. And if you're already a partner, I want to say thank you, partner. You're making a difference in other people's lives. And if you become a partner today by going online or giving us a call, we'll immediately send you a couple books as our way of saying welcome to the partner family. We'll send you Denise's book called The Gift of Forgiveness and my book called Life in the Combat Zone. We're not prophesying a combat zone to our partners. Most people are already in some kind of a combat zone. They need to know how to get through it. That's why the subtitle says, How to Survive, Thrive, and Overcome in the Midst of Difficult Situations. And this book is dedicated to partners. So when you become a partner, we'll send it to you, both of these. But today I want you to reach for your Bible. We're going to return to our anchor verse. I have my Bible. I hope that you have yours. And our anchor verse for this series is 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19, where Paul is writing to the Corinthians. And he says, what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you're not your own? The reason Paul wrote this to the Corinthians is because they were doing things they shouldn't have been doing. They were going to see prostitutes. They were going to places of sin. And Paul said, what? In fact, when you read this in the Greek, it is an exclamation. What? What is this? How is this humanly possible? What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? In Greek, the word know is the word oida. It carries the idea of a comprehension. The word not is the emphatic version of the word no. Paul is literally saying, do you not know? Have you not gotten it yet that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? The word body in Greek is the word soma, and it refers to the physical human body. My body has become the temple of the Holy Spirit. That means I need to treat it like it is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And the word temple is the Greek word naos. The word naos describes a highly decorated shrine. Just imagine vaulted ceilings, marbles, stones, gold, silver, rich embellishments. All of that would be in this word naos, here translated as the word temple. And as I've told you, it is the same word used in the Old Testament Greek Septuagint, to describe the innermost parts of the temple in Jerusalem or the Holy of Holies. And here Paul is saying, do you not understand who you are? How can you do the things you're doing if you really know who you are? You're the temple of God. The temple of God can't do the things that you're doing with your bodies. You shouldn't be going where you're going and doing what you're doing. Don't you understand who you are? You have become the naos, 
the temple of the Holy Spirit. You are the walking sanctuary of God. The Holy of Holies is right here. God does not dwell in physical buildings. He lives inside us. And if our eyes were open to see our spiritual interiors, oh, we would be dumbfounded to see the lavish ornamentation of God inside us. In fact, what God has constructed in us is so magnificent that God said, that's my new holy of holies. I'm going to live right there. And God moved in us by his spirit. And that's why Paul goes on in verse 19 and says, what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you? That word in in Greek is the word in. It means literally in you. This is where this treasure is located, which you have of God. Ye have in Greek is a form of the word echo, which means to have, to hold, or to possess. We have within us, almost as if we are containers, this temple of the Holy Ghost. But Paul says, which you have of God, the word of is the Greek word apo, coming directly from God, which means what we have in us is not because of our personal rehabilitation, not because we've tried to reform ourselves. What we have in us is a gift from God. Salvation comes from God. The temple of the Holy Ghost being in us is something that's brought into us by God. All of this is of God. And Paul goes on to say, and you are not your own, which means we have to live with a sense of responsibility. And this leads us to verse 20. For you're bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body, and in your spirit, which are God's. But notice he says, you are bought with a price. The word bought is a Greek word, agarazo. This is very, very important. This is really where we get the concept of redemption. The word agarazo is also where we get the Greek word agora. The word agora described the marketplace. But when you use the word agora in context of redemption, it has to do with the slave market. Well, the slave market in the first century was a disgusting, deplorable place where human beings were put on the auction block and they were sold. Slaves were abused. They were traded back and forth between their masters and they were sold into slavery for the rest of their lives. This word agora and the word agarazo, here translated bought, are really connected. And the Bible's teaching us that when Jesus came into the world, he came into the world and entered into Satan's slave market where all of the human race was bound and sold in sin. That's precisely what the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 6. We were all the servants of sin. We were sold into sin. Sin was our master. The devil traded us from one form of bondage to another, to another, to another slapping us around, trading us around until Jesus came. And Jesus paid the ultimate price to redeem us, to buy us out of that disgusting slavery to sin. And Paul says, you're bought with a price. The word price is the Greek word time, which describes something that is costly and extremely valuable. And the Greek would be better translated, you were bought at a great price price. The price paid for you is the highest price ever paid for a slave. Jesus gave his life. He gave his own blood to purchase you and to purchase me. So Paul says, therefore, in Greek, it says, consequently, as a result, in response to what he has done for you, therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. The word glorify the Greek word dokadzo, from the Greek word dokeo, which really is the word which means to think, which means we need to really put our mind to how we're going to glorify God in our life. You can't be lazy about it or lackadaisical or just hope that it happens. The word glorify really is from the word dokeo. It means to think, to estimate, to appraise, to give real weight and consideration to. You have to really determine how you're going to glorify God. You've got to put your mind into it. That's so very important. It says, therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Well, most people would say, well, I already glorify God in my spirit because that's where God lives. And that's true. He does. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. But this verse also says you're to glorify God in your soma, 
in your physical body because it's no longer yours. It now belongs to Jesus. Jesus purchased you. He purchased your spirit. He purchased your body. He purchased your mind. He purchased you. And you are no longer your own. Say amen. So this verse commands you as a result of all of this to really put your mind to it and determine how you're going to glorify God in your body and in your spirit because they are God's. But hold on. When you jump back over to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 16, Paul talks about the corporate body of Christ. Listen to what he says. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? But in this case, he's no longer speaking to the individual, but he's speaking to the church at large. Just like each of us are a walking sanctuary, we corporately as the church make a magnificent sanctuary for the Spirit of God. And that's what Paul now says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 16. Know ye not, and guess what? In Greek it is the same identical phrase which we find in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 19. It is the word oida. The word oida carries the idea of a comprehension. It is the emphatic form of the word no. When you put it all together, don't you get it? Have you not yet comprehended? Do you not understand that you corporately as a church are the temple of God? And the word temple again is the Greek word naos. Just like you individually are a walking sanctuary, we as a body form a huge, magnificent dwelling place for God. That is precisely what this verse teaches. In fact, it says, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Wow. That word dwelleth, the Greek word oikeo, describes one that dwells in a house, one that has taken up residency, one that has settled into a home, one that actually feels at home in a particular place. It depicts one that is a permanent Indweller. God has permanently moved into the church. And we as the church corporately, we form a magnificent, massive dwelling place for God himself. God has moved in. He has taken up residency. He has settled into the church. He is at home in the church. God is a permanent resident in the church. And in response to this, Paul says in verse 17, If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. This is quite a warning. First of all, he says, if any man, in Greek it is the word tis, it throws open the door, anyone at all, male or female, it is gender neutral, if anyone defiles the temple of God is talking about the corporate church. What does the word defile mean? Well, the word defile means to corrupt, to deteriorate figuratively, to cause a moral deterioration. It is a decom decomposition or a breakdown, causing something to move from a higher level to a lower level. So in this verse, if any man, if anyone at all is a contributor to defiling the church, deteriorating the church, wasting the church, causing the church to break down, to move from a higher level to a lower level, if any man does this to the temple of God, it's talking about the church corporately, him shall God destroy. And guess what? The word destroy and the word defile in Greek are identically the same Greek word. So when the Bible says, him shall God destroy, it literally means him will God corrupt. God will deteriorate him. God will cause him to decompose, to break down. God will do to him what he has done to the church, which means emphatically the way we touch the church will determine how we are going to be touched. Now, there's a great example of this in Scripture and it is in 1 Samuel, and I want to share it with you. In 1 Samuel, we find that Eli was the judge of Israel, and he had two sons named Hophni and Phinehas. Hophni and Phinehas really did not know the Lord, but they were in ministry, and they were doing wrong to the people of God. They were taking more money 
than they were supposed to earn. And they were having sex with women at the altar at the house of God. And the Bible tells us people were so hurt by what was taking place at church or at this place of worship. Listen to what it says in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 17. Wherefore, the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord, for men abhorred the offering of the Lord, or people stopped coming to church because they were tired of being abused. These young men were wasting the house of God. They were corrupting the house of God. They were negatively affecting the people of God. And guess what? When you really read the story of Hophni and Phinehas, God tolerated them for a long time. Even though they were in sin and they were doing wrong, judgment did not quickly come. God is never in a rush to judge. But when their behavior became so foul that people stopped coming to church, that's when God said, all right, they've crossed the line no further, and judgment came. The way they touched God's house is the way they ultimately were touched. This is such a strong warning that we understand the temple of God is holy. And that's what now Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God, the Greek says, defile. It is identically the same Greek word. If you do wrong to the house of God, it will be done to you exactly in the same way. For the temple of God is holy. The word holy here is the Greek word hagias. It describes something that is holy, something that is consecrated, something that is different, something that is separate, something that is special. The house of God is so special, it must be treated as something that is holy, consecrated, separate, special. That is who the house of God is. For the house of God is holy. And then he adds, which temple you are. He's no longer speaking to them individually. He's speaking to them corporately. You as the church form the house of God in your city. Treat it right because God is there. And my friend, we need to really understand who we are individually We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We are walking sanctuaries. Corporately, we form a habitation for God in our city. Our church is a place that God has settled into. He's taken up residency, and we need to treat the church holy because that's what it is. And just remember, how you touch the church will determine how you'll be touched. So make sure you touch the church correctly. I'll be back in just a moment. And I want to pray for you. Do you really know what the Bible means when it says you are the temple of the Holy Spirit? My friend, you really are the dwelling place for the Spirit of God. And that is amazing and powerful. In this fabulous 10-part series, You Are the Temple of the Holy Spirit, Rick Renner unwraps all the intricacies of what the Bible means when it declares that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. God put forth His best work when you were born again. And then God placed his greatest treasure deep inside you. In this series, you'll learn you are God's masterpiece. You are a repository of God's greatest treasure. You are sealed and guaranteed by God's spirit. You are filled with the riches of Christ. This life transforming 10 part series is available in digital or physical formats, starting at just $20. In addition to this teaching series, you can also purchase the book, A Life Ablaze. In this book, Rick lays out everything you need to live an intimate, uncompromising life and stay on fire with the Holy Spirit's power for years to come. You can do it, but you need to know how, and that is what you'll discover in this timely book. Order your copy today because it will help you throw the right fuels into your fire to get you burning again. Order your copy of A Life Ablaze today for only $18. Don't miss this special offer. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit and the book, A Life Ablaze. Call the number on your screen now or go to renner.org to order. Call or go online now. My name is Joel Renner, and right behind me through this wonderful park is one of our Moscow Good News Church satellite churches. You know, everyone needs a good church they can call their spiritual home. As a ministry, we're believing for revival of the Bible in people's lives, and to have a church you can call your home is so very important. For decades, we have been working in the countries of the former Soviet Union. 
and we have started churches in Riga, the capital of Latvia. Moscow, the capital of Russia. And Kiev, the capital of Ukraine. Every city where we have opened a church has brought its own similar and unique challenges. But the goal has always been the same, to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have also started an online church that is touching people in countries we have never been to and people we could never reach. People all over the world need the gospel and we are so glad that our online church is an answer for them. After we dedicated the Moscow Good News Church building, we started taking churches to other regions of Moscow and now we're opening satellite churches all over this wonderful city. Moscow is huge and we need to take the gospel to as many people as possible in our wonderful city. One way to do this is by opening satellite churches so the people all over Moscow have a good spiritual home. If you're one of our partners, I want to say thank you from the bottom of our heart. Spreading the gospel is so important. People need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ just like you did one day. If you're not one of our partners, I want to invite you to become one. Would you please consider supporting us financially so we can continue to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ all over the globe? It is so important. Please call or go online to renter.org to give. Through your generous financial support, we can continue to make a huge difference in people's lives around the world. Thank you for joining me for today's program. We've been looking at what it means to be the corporate church. We as the church are the temple of God. And the Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, that God has settled into the church and made himself at home in the church. God lives in the church, and we need to know how to respect the church because God is here. We are literally the temple of God. And this is just one little piece of a big series that I'm teaching, which is called, You Are the Temple of the Holy Spirit. Do you really understand that the Spirit of God dwells in you? My friend, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You need to understand this. You need to have a revelation of it, and you need to hear this teaching again and again and again. So please order this 10-part series today. It comes in multiple formats, and it comes with a study guide. The study guide is filled with all the points, the principles, everything in these programs is also in the study guide. And we're offering you my book, which is called A Life Ablaze. 10 simple keys to living on fire for God. Not starting on fire, living on fire for God. My friend, you can live on fire for God and be a life ablaze. And this book will help you know how to do that. But let me pray for you, Father. I thank you so much that we individually are the temple of the Holy Spirit and corporately we form the habitation of God in the church. Help us to respect the church, to love the church, and to touch it with loving care. In Jesus' name, amen. It's been so good to be with you today. Tomorrow we're going to be coming back and I'm going to talk to you more about what it means to be the temple of the Holy Spirit. But until then, remember Ecclesiastes 8.4 where the word of a king is, there is power. Thank you for joining Rick Renner today. For more information about Rick Renner Ministries and product resources, visit renner.org and connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram.